All right, let's get this thing started. Hey, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, May 22nd, 2015. Uh, this week, we got a bunch of cool stories. We're going to have uh, talking about the light sail, of course. Uh, we're going to talk about Chinese plans to land on the far side of the moon, uh, more certification for SpaceX to for this week in Musk, and uh, why Mars gets blue sunsets. So uh, we've got our regular uh, rogue uh, this week in that we've got Morgan Redberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. This is good, and this almost would have been the Morgan and Fraser show. However, we've got a special guest this week. We've got Dr. Reese Taylor. Reese, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Very good to be here. And uh, I guess <laughs> Reese is going to be our stand-in for Sondi this week because uh, also a radio Look astronomer. Yeah. <laughs> for, it's, it's hard to fill Sonny's shoes, but uh, you should be, our, do, be able to do a pretty good job. So we're going to take a few minutes and just talk to Reese about uh, sort of what he does and what he's working on, and then uh, we're going to sort of go into all of the stories this week, and Reese is going to help us out. So, um, so just before we do, I just want to remind everybody this is a live interactive experience. Uh, you can talk to us, and we will talk to you. And the the way this happens is use the Q&A app. So if you just go wherever you're watching this, uh, anywhere out on the internets, you should see, if you're watching this live video, you should see a link that says that we're interacting with the public. You can click that link. You can still watch the show, but now you can post any questions and uh, we uh, we should I think we're gonna have a lot of time this week to to answer a bunch of questions. So um, we've got Amanda Tesk. I'm gonna say hi to Amanda Tesk, to Stephen Hawkins, not Stephen Hawking, Hawkins, Douglas Crandall, Noel Repenthal, Guido Bibra, Sylvan Westby, Michael Mayer, Sev Dustbunny, Ignati Romanov, Cherengovsky. No, I'm gonna say the whole thing, Ignati. This is just how it's gonna happen. Got some uh, new Nancy, names every week. Yep, Nancy Graziano, Tony Lynch, Jim Meeker, Michael Jobin. Linda Static, Graham Ash, uh, I think it's everybody. So uh, now a lot of those names that you're hearing, they actually come from a really dedicated community that's really, really in a symbiotic relationship here with the Weekly Space Hangout. And this is the WSH crew, and this is a community on Google Plus, small but very dedicated. They they really now uh, pick all the stories that we're going to be covering this week, or they suggest all the stories that they would like to hear about, and uh, by just posting interesting stories in there, and then we kind of collect them together. They also organize all of the guests, so I literally had no idea that Reese was going to be on the show until a, I checked to see who was going to be on the show today, and then I uh, sent, him an in, sent him the invite. So, so it's awesome. So if you want to really, I think... Help make the sh the content. If, you, if you're fascinated by space and astronomy news, and you want to not only just kind of uh, watch a show about it, but you actually want to be a part of it and and suggest the kinds of stories that you want to hear more about, and even recommend the format. This is the place to go. So I highly recommend you go in and and join the WSH crew on Google Plus, and it's a great community and uh, and. And as you can see, you literally can now pull the puppet strings and just tell us what to do, and we will we will we live to serve. So, uh, cool. Well, let's get cracking. So, uh, first, Reese, who are you, and why are you here? Isn't that the question we're all asking? That really is a fundamental, deep question, and I was hoping that you could answer it for all of us. Well, I was hoping to start with an easier question, like hydrogen or something, but I'll try. So I am a postdoc. I currently work in Prague. I, I come originally from Cardiff in Wales in the United Kingdom. I did my undergraduate and my PhD there, lived with my parents until I was 27, and then just to confuse the heck out of everyone, I decided I'd move to Puerto Rico for a couple of years and do a postdoc in Arecibo. So I was there for two and a half years, and then I moved to Prague, and my research is mostly about uh, neutral hydrogen in distant galaxies. I study galaxy evolution by trying to see uh, how their gas is affected in different environments by different processes. So, I mean, but to go to Arecibo, that seems weird. D isn't the only thing that people do in Arecibo is zap asteroids and listen for messages? You've been from listening to Sony too much. I, I thought that was the only thing Arecibo was used for, and that no. and talk to aliens. It does lots of things, and it does not talk to aliens very often. <laughs> or ever so far. Well, they've sent me they have sent messages to the aliens, but I'm not sure if that counts as talking, and they certainly haven't responded, so they're certainly not holding conversations with aliens. So, okay, so so you, so the work, so 
I guess specifically, what things have you been working at, and especially what were you doing with Arecibo? Right. So sure. So d during my PhD, I was listening to this talk, which was uh, given by who became my PhD supervisor, talking about these the idea of these dark galaxies, and these are galaxies which are basically just dark matter and gas and no stars. So they are optically dark, but they have hydrogen gas. And of course, the best way to find those is by looking for the neutral hydrogen uh, content, if they have any, uh, which Arecibo is superb at doing because it's the largest single dish in the world. It's one of the most sensitive radio telescopes. Uh, and so my project was using data from a project called AGES, the Arecibo Galaxy Environment Survey, which scans the sky looking for hydrogen, just like you would do with an optical telescope looking for stars, but looking for the hydrogen instead. So, and so my project was to look through these detections and see if we could find any objects which didn't have stars and only had hydrogen. Right, and so that hydrogen, that's the, but those are the building blocks of stars, right? I mean, that's yes, the cold exactly. hydrogen left over from the, from the Big Bang. Yeah, we think that neutral hydrogen is the sort of the, like a galaxy's fuel tank. It's the reservoir uh, from which stars can ultimately be formed, although how we get from that neutral hydrogen gas into something like a star is still a process that's not terribly well understood. So what's the mechanism then that would get us a dark galaxy? Is it a, is it a situation that it just didn't have enough hydrogen to ever get any stars actually forming? Or did something strip out the, the stars and keep the dark matter and, and gas together? Well, we, we, we certainly know that that second scenario is definitely possible. We know of many objects where we see galaxies having their hydrogen ripped off them or, or stripped out as they move through an intergalactic medium so that this other hot gas can push the gas out of the galaxies. And we know that happens. We see that happens. And we also sometimes see condensations of this gas within these long hydrogen streams, uh, which can resemble galaxies in a few circumstances. But the really controversial one is the, 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 the one that you first suggested, which is just having gas which is just too low density uh, for stars to form. And no one really knows if that's possible or not. These things are very intensely controversial. The idea of them, the way they were, the reason they were proposed is because a lot of our cosmological models based on dark matter have predicted that there should be more galaxies around the Milky Way than we actually observe. And so one idea is that maybe if you just don't have quite enough gas falling into them, some of them just don't form stars. Well, I, I mean, I guess sort of a similar analogy is this idea of rogue planets here in the in the the Milky Way, right? Where where we see brown dwarfs and maybe even rogue planets. You can imagine a a cloud of gas that gathers together uh, enough hydrogen gas to maybe pull into a ball, but not yeah. ignite in in fusion. And so maybe if you have like I guess something thinly distributed across an entire galaxy, you could get sort of the same situation at a galactic scale. Yeah, uh, the, the really weird thing is that we know quite a lot of situations where this neutral hydrogen gas isn't forming stars. I mean, even in most galaxies, the hydrogen is more extended than the, the optical, the stars, by around a factor of two. So there's, we know there's a lot of hydrogen that's not forming stars. But the, the very strange thing that we, no one has yet fully explained is why don't we ever see these clouds of hydrogen without any stars at all? And that's really still something of a mystery. So, I mean, is that just because, um, like, I'm, like, why is that a mystery? I guess I'm a little confused. I mean, like, why couldn't you have a big cloud of gas that's that just hasn't collapsed yet? Well, that's the thing. Um, in, in principle, perhaps you can, but we don't see them. They're not observed. They are, if they do exist, they are extremely rare. And. Is it possible, I mean, is it, is it a temperature thing? I mean, is it possible that they're, they're colder, that they're just not getting picked up by, you know, they're not putting out that, that, the radiation on that specific line? Or? We don't think so. I mean, all neutral hydrogen is, uh, emits on the 21 centimeter frequency, and it's only in the very rare cases it gets extremely cold uh, that you have these very strange effects happening where it doesn't emit. But we don't think that's the case because the physics of the hydrogen doesn't seem to lend too much credence to, to that possibility. So if they do exist, we should be able to find them, or we think. Right, so let's, let's talk a bit about actually using the Arecibo and sort of the advantages and disadvantages of being a, uh, a radio uh, astronomer. Uh, 
Um, mm. You know, we 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 get enough from Nicole about this, uh, just about the fact that you get to you get to observe in the day, right? Uh, all not, weather. All weather certainly, uh, except for maybe thunderstorms, but. Um, not during the day for me because uh, solar radiation still causes too much interference so we only ever observe at night which uh, increases our sensitivity okay so you so you get to observe only during the night but the weather doesn't matter unless it's really thunderstorm yeah. well that's good but the, the downside night. is the resolution right you only get like one pixel at a time no we we actually get seven no less oh seven pixels oh yeah. great yeah, <laughs> it's it's wonderful, isn't it? It's <laughs> you think of Hubble and all these gigapixel cameras. Radio is limited to seven or at most thirteen, but of course that's still seven times better than only having one pixel. And that is one of the reasons these projects that I work on have become possible in the last ten years or so. Before that, doing it with one pixel would be no one really wants to spend seven years surveying one small patch of sky. One year, okay, but seven, no. This is too much. Right, and so you've turned what would have been a seven-year job into a one-year job. Uh, so can you kind of explain to people then sort of why the resolution is so low on these radio telescopes? Yeah, it's because the wavelength is very different to what you look at in the optical. The normal visible light you see has a wavelength of maybe a few hundred billionths of a meter, so it's it's very, very small, and that means if you have a dish that's a meter across, you're you are collecting uh, a very great many photons from that, so you're, you're sampling a lot of this very high frequency radiation. With the 21 centimeter line, well, that's about yay big, roughly, uh, and so if you have a, t a telescope that's just a meter across, that's only about well, five wavelengths, so your resolution is way, way worse. The, the advantage that you have is that you don't need to make your mirror, your reflector, so precise, because you're receiving this very, very long wavelength, so it's possible to build a, a useful 300 meter dish, and, but even so, that's still, that's still not enough. Planet, right? I'm sorry? You can, ha you can have a, a, an observatory the size of planet Earth. You can. You can do interferometry, and you can place different telescopes around the planet, and you can link them together in a very sophisticated way that gets you uh, actually, in fact, the best resolution possible. And actually, you can get a telescope that's bigger than the Earth, because there is currently in orbit the, the Radio Astron Telescope. Uh, which is a Russian telescope, and that has baselines, I think, of a few hundred thousand kilometers. And and um, so then let's talk a bit about the future then, and sort of what new. I mean, we all think of the Arecibo as sort of the state of the art, the greatest radio telescope mm -hmm. ever built. Because it is. It is. <laughs> it's a monster. But now you're having things like the square kilometer array and and observatories like that that are starting to be built. So so is I mean. In the rest of astronomy, we talk about the, the new mega telescopes, and, mm. and that's the classification. I've decided they're mega telescopes. Um, things like the, uh, you know, the Magellan, the Large Synoptic Survey, the, uh, the Binocular Telescope, all these monster telescopes, and, mm. and the Square Kilometer Array is the, is the version of that in the radio, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that really will revolutionize astronomy when it eventually comes online, but of course, Building this is a formidable challenge, and uh, if we were to build it today, I've been told that the electricity costs alone would run into the millions of dollars per day. So it's it's a formidable engineering and technical challenge to to construct that. Uh, when it does eventually happen, it, it's going to be a phenomenally powerful instrument, but it's, we're not there yet. Uh, and are there are there plans in the works? I mean, is that sort of the big one that everybody's counting on? Or are there other plans in the works to make other instruments? And and you mentioned that there's I you know I actually didn't know there's a Russian uh, uh, radio uh, yeah radio telescope in space. Are are there more plans to build more space based observatories? Is it even worthwhile doing it? Yes, it is. And that was actually something that people were skeptical about, uh, whether there would be any advantage in having such high resolution. People thought that you wouldn't even see structures that were that small, because the resolution of this thing is on, if I'm not wrong, on the order of micro arc seconds, which is absolutely tiny and far better than you do in the optical. But they proved that wrong, that well, it, they have made useful discoveries from this. So, But I, I haven't heard of any other plans in the works for future radio satellites. Uh, as far as the, the ground-based ones go, there are also a number of others ongoing. So 
SKA is definitely the big one, but we'll build up to that incrementally with things like ASCAP and Meerkat in South Africa and Australia, which are the so-called SKA Pathfinder telescopes. And of course, there's also the 500 meter telescope in China, FAST. Well, can we talk a bit about the, about this concept? I mean, you've talked about the baseline and mm. and sort of like, you know, what is the difference between building one really big observatory like the Arecibo or building something that's maybe a whole bunch of dishes taking up like a one kilometer area using interferometry and this idea of having a spacecraft that participates in in inter interferometer. What are the sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages of each kind of of uh, instrument? Sure, they they all do have advantages and disadvantages, and you you you. It's much better if you use them in concert with one another rather than replacing one or the other. So, a big single dish telescope gets you very good column density sensitivity, and what that means is that you can detect very thin gas that you you can't do with an interferometer because of the, the mathematics involved actually makes the, that much harder to detect. So Arecibo is something like 100 to 1,000 times better than the VLA, for example, for detecting this very faint, thin gas. And of course, the interferometers have the advantage of being much, much larger, and having larger baselines gets you better resolution. So Arecibo has this resolution of three and a half arc minutes, which is um, about the same as your eye very roughly. Uh, the VLA can do about uh, a fifth of that, so just 20 arc seconds, so very, very much better. And that is the, the main advantage of an interferometer. Uh, the space-based interferometer is uh, really just an extension of that. You have an even longer baseline, so you have even better resolution. Uh, but the penalty there is, of course, you, you don't have very much of this, this enormous baseline filled with receivers. So you've got this enormous hole in your telescope, if you like, and that makes it much more difficult to detect, say, low column density gas. And of course, it reduces your sensitivity uh, very substantially. So it's, so it's almost like this sort of balance between, as you said, sensitivity and, and resolution, right? Yeah, so it's exactly. either, can you see a very tiny object? You know, could you detect um, you know, a radio tower on an alien world, or could you detect something with very sensitivity? Could you could you detect a very low uh, transmission power uh, yeah. radio tower on an alien world, right? And that's just the difference. That's it, yes. Yeah, and so if it's a very small point source or whether it is the power level. So, and I mean, that, that this idea of interferometry has been brought into, you know, infrared astronomy and even visual astronomy, mm. it's just that the, I guess the, the wavelength is so great in radio that you can even do it, right? It's, it's a lot easier in radio because the wavelength is so much longer. You don't have to be quite so precise with, uh, with your setup. But of course, you do have to be pretty precise. It's not easy, but it's a lot easier than do it in the, in the optical, for example. But you can even do it after the fact, can't you? You can like take a bunch of observations with one telescope, one radio telescope, and then just use software to kind of filter them together, can't you? I I think you have to take them simultaneously. I don't believe you can take it with one telescope and then wait and take it with another. No, no, no. Do it simultaneously, but yeah. just but just filter it afterwards. Like I know with the yes, with the big yes, visual can... right with the big visual observatories, that. like like you literally you're you're having to time them within nanoseconds. So there's yes. no way to kind of, you know, line up the sound waves the way you could with, say, with, say radio. Um, so let's talk about sort of the big unsettled questions in astronomy that you would love to see answered now and sort of within your wheelhouse. So where is sort of the, what's the state of the art of, of where you're working? Ooh, uh, tough question. Um, very good question. What is the state of the art? There, there, I think there's so many unanswered questions. It's sort of... It's very hard to pin that one down. I mean, I, for one, would love to know, does dark matter really exist? I mean, I, my, my inclination is strongly that it does, but until we actually detect that particle directly, we can't ever really be 100% certain. And, of course, my research is sort of based largely on, on looking for this, the, the effect of this stuff. So it would really satisfy me a lot if we got a really good detection of a particle. I don't see your problem with this. Like, like we can use it as a telescope. 
we can use it to detect, uh, you know, vast distances. You know, we can we can sort of see its concentrations using gravitational lensing. Why do you got to know what it is? Just 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 use it. Just accept that it's out there. Well, that's actually what we do most of the time. But I know. there's always that that nagging doubt, and I think you should always have that nagging doubt until you've actually seen something directly as to. Are you really just barking up completely the wrong tree and building a, this huge and wonderful house of cards that might all come crashing down if you're not very careful? Yeah. Uh, okay, so what is dark matter? Okay, anything else you'd like to, to really get an answer to? Oh, uh, <laughs> that would do me. If I could yep. get that question answered decisively, I'd be a very happy man. Yep, and, so uh, you've and talked... if you did it, Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Go ahead, so you've, ta you've talked about you know two kinds of radio telescopes. You have terrestrial radio telescopes and space-based radio telescopes. But some people are also suggesting that we build uh, a radio telescope on the far side of the moon. Uh, do you think that's practical for radio astronomy? Uh, do, do the benefits outweigh certainly the enormous costs and the challenges? Uh, and would that help substantially answer some of these big questions? Well, in one sense, it would be good because it would block out a lot of the radio frequency interference, which is becoming increasingly a problem for uh, sites like Arecibo, which were originally constructed in what were then fairly remote areas, but are now getting ever more built up. So people have more Wi-Fi, they have more mobile phones, and of course that and that reduces the amount of of, uh, of the radio wavelength that you can actually usefully detect with it. Uh, and so, in that sense, building a telescope on the moon would be a good idea because you could, you could cut all that out. Is it practical? No. Nowhere near. We, we, we don't have anything like the space infrastructure, I think, even in the foreseeable future to, to do that. I'd love to see it happen, but, uh, of course, on the other hand, you, you don't actually need that much. You don't need the mass of an entire moon to block out RFI. You could just have a metal shield behind your dish, and that would do just as good a job. Right. And then you could walk out in your shorts and t-shirt and tinker with it with a wrench as as necessary, as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, float around, go on a space yeah. walk, do your thing. Yeah, or make it twice as big, right? Like, I think this is the situation, like, hmm. does it make sense to try and put one of these observatories in space where you're out of the atmosphere, or does it make sense to just build a much bigger telescope on Earth that you can then upgrade the instruments, you can fix it, repair it? It's a, you know... Right. Um, I mean, even on Earth, we're already at sort of, well, Arecibo has held the record as largest single dish for over 50 years, and it's only going to be exceeded in the next few years by this uh, Chinese fast telescope. So the thought of putting one in space seems like a, a really very good idea, but it is still just completely wildly impractical. Um, so we got a couple of questions that are from the viewers, and then once we kind of get through these, I think we'll we'll move on to the actual space stories. Um, so this comes from Ignaty Romanov Chernigovsky. Uh, if we were to build a solar system-sized array, what could we do with it, and how far are we from having the necessary technology? What couldn't we do with it? What couldn't we do with it? So a baseline, the the width of, of I guess what two AU? Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> Where's my calculator? What the heck would the resolution of that thing be? 1.22 lambda over d. So times 21. Wolfram Alpha could probably help you with that. Yeah. What is 2 AU in meters? I'm googling this. <laughs> it's just faster. Uh, 150. Well, of course, about 300 million kilometers. Mm. I should know that. Yeah, 300 million kilometers. Yeah. 300 million meters. Two. Yeah. Anyway, um, and then I guess the next question is is the and, resolution and of eight point five times ten to the minus thirteen, which will be in radians, which is just a an absurdly no number. I don't even know what the name for that uh, numerical prefix minus is. Minus thirteen in the yottas or something. Something like that. Yeah, a yotta meter. <laughs> um, what would that let you see? Um, I have no idea. All right, uh, and so then this, the next question is: How far are we from having the necessary technology? We have that, right? I mean, it's just how big do you want to make your dish and try and get it into space? Yeah, essentially. I mean, we could put a telescope around Pluto, but of course, then you have that problem that you have essentially have a very large dish with an enormous hole in the middle, and that right. causes a lot of problems. And that reduces the sensitivity of what you can actually see. So it's uh, 
it's, it's uh, not so great in that sense. Right. Unless you're really? looking for extremely if someone... sources and you really want to resolve them really, really well, that would that would be great. But if you wanted to see more normal features, maybe not so useful. Okay, so if someone wanted to give you access to this new observatory, you would turn them down? Nah. No, you <laughs> Find it, something right. to do with it. Uh, so this question comes from uh, Adam Synergy. Reese, you found an uncatalogued blue compact dwarf galaxy, which looks like it's within the local volume, but has not been associated with the local group. Has Someone anyone is able to confirm attention. your findings? Yes, we have a very <laughs> astute audience here. So what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, I, so it looks like it's within the local volume, but it's not been associated with the local group. Has anyone been able to confirm this? Um, well, essentially, we did, because we, we had follow-up observations with Arecibo to make sure we hadn't just got some weird noise going on, so we, we re-observed it, found it was there. Uh, we don't yet, as yet have a better distance determination to this object, so uh, presumably this person must have read the paper, and they'll know it's probably around 7 megaparsecs away, which is around 20 million light-years. Uh, as yet, we don't have any other plans to follow that up, because there's there's only so much time that we have to, to do things, and it's it's a matter of prioritizing. And right now, there are more interesting objects to research. Okay, great. So we're gonna do uh, we're gonna switch now to the to the space news portion of this. Uh, Reese, you want to stick around and and oh. and opine about various mm -hmm. stuff in space and astronomy? I'll do what I can. That's fantastic. Uh, okay, cool. So, Morgan, uh, let's talk about the light sail. Yeah, so uh, on Wednesday, two days ago, uh, the Planetary Society's uh, Technology Demonstrations spacecraft, uh, Light Sail A, was launched uh, alongside the uh, X-37 uh, Air Force space plane on top of an Atlas V. Uh, the uh, Atlas V kicked off the uh, light sail sort of partway along the orbit and then continued up to deliver the space plane to parts unknown. Um, and so the idea here is to test a, a solar sail. And solar sails work basically the same way that sailing ship sails work here on Earth, but instead of using air moving wind, they use light. Uh, even though light doesn't have any mass, it still carries energy and it still carries momentum. And that means that every time a photon hits you, if you turn your face up to the sun and you look at it, uh, all that light is pushing you around. Now, it doesn't push very hard. And so certainly we don't experience the effects of this uh, on our bodies here on Earth. Uh, but if you have a big enough sail out in space that's getting hit by enough photons, you could actually make an appreciable difference. And it, it gets to the point where it's sort of on the same level as the ion drives uh, that we're starting to use to get around the inner solar system. Uh, things like uh, the Dawn spacecraft is using an ion drive to more effectively uh, get around the inner solar system. And it uses a small amount of power uh, to give you small acceleration, but that builds up over time. Uh, normally, you, b you burn a chemical rocket for like a minute or two minutes or at most an hour uh, to get going, and then you coast the rest of your journey. Uh, but with a solar sail, you're constantly accelerating on your way to wherever you're going. And so although you start very slow, there's the, the possibility that you can attain extremely high speeds over uh, long periods of time, years or even decades, uh, and ultimately solar sails might be one of the most uh, practical ways to initially send spacecraft uh, out of the solar system and to other stars. Yeah, I, uh, one of the thing, great things about the solar sail, and people, I think, a lot of people have a sort of misnomer about how these things work, right? They imagine the solar sail like a sail being blown away from the sun, right? And and it would sort of fly away. But actually, when you think about the solar sail, you know, it's going to be orbiting the sun just the way the Earth is orbiting the sun in the same, roughly the same orbit. And then to raise its orbit, all it does is it tilts at an angle to the sun so that the sun bouncing off of the solar sail speeds up its its orbit and of course when you speed up your orbit you raise the orbit and it you know it raises it towards say Mars which is sort of the same way the rockets work but you can do it in reverse you can turn the solar sail so now it's going the other way and now the rays of light from the Sun are slowing it down in the orbit 
and it'll actually then lower its orbit and you could have a solar sail either go out to Jupiter, out to Saturn, or down to the inner planets. It could go, you know, it could it could use its own propulsion to get down to to Venus, to Mercury, all that. And then you of course could use lasers to speed them up. You could fire your laser beam at the at the thing and actually, you know, speed it up, especially when it's nearby the Earth. So it's a it's an amazing technology. Yeah, that's right, and it's going to be one of the technologies that we use uh, in the coming century to propel spacecraft. Uh, and this actually isn't the first solar sail that's been successfully launched. Uh, both the Japanese Space Agency uh, and NASA have launched experimental solar sails in uh, the last half decade or so. Uh, but what makes this Planetary Society mission unique is that it's privately funded. Uh, it's funded uh, through donations that people have made uh, generally to the Planetary Society, uh, but also supported uh, on Kickstarter. They were looking to raise uh, about a million dollars, and uh, they've raised more than half of that uh, funding so far. And the launch that happened back on Wednesday is just the first part of a two-stage uh, project. And what they're doing right now is showing that the spacecraft works. They have a CubeSat, which is kind of a shoebox-sized satellite, uh, connected to uh, a small solar sail. And they're basically demonstrating that they can communicate with the satellite, that they can unfurl the sail, all of these things. They won't actually be doing solar sailing uh, how you just described it during this mission because they're so far down into the atmosphere that drag from Earth's atmosphere is larger than the force that light can exert on the, the spacecraft. And so uh, it's drag with the Earth that ultimately is going to guide where uh, light sail A goes. But next year, they intend to launch uh, aboard uh, the Falcon Heavy and get much farther away from Earth where they don't have this drag problem, use a larger sail, and they can get uh, actual solar sail demonstrations underway. Uh, and so right now, they're just working to show that, that their investment is, is capable of doing that. And I think this kind of technology, like once they figure this out, this is a great um, sort of secondary propulsion system that you could attach to almost any spacecraft. Very lightweight, you know, doesn't require any power, doesn't require any propulsion. And, you know, if you want to make some modifications to your orbit after, say, the life, after you've run out of propulsion or you want to do, you're willing to do a long, slow orbit adjustment, run on the solar sail and then use the propulsion for, you know, for, for quicker boost if you need to do some kind of orbital insertion or something like that. So I, I suspect, just like with the ion engines and such, over time, spacecraft are going to have a real complement of these different kinds of propulsion methods and then have that solar sail as the backup or have the solar sail as for certain kinds of operations. I think it's uh, I think it's terrific that the that the planetary society is doing this. And it's it's funny when you think of the number of satellites that die because they just completely ran out of their propellant or they, they had no way to orient themselves anymore or no way to 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 get themselves into a higher orbit. There's even all of these satellites that maybe have been kicked into a useless orbit, you know, because of a launch failure, and they didn't have enough propulsion on board to be able to, you know, they're they're not going to degrade, but they didn't they didn't have enough propulsion on board to get themselves into a useful orbit. And you could imagine, like, hey, just fine, go to Plan B, deploy the solar sail, and and take some time, or maybe even you know shoot a big laser at it to to try and kind of kick it up to the next next level. So it's uh, this is really exciting. Yeah, maybe the coolest use for a solar sail that that I've heard of is a mission, a CubeSat mission that's going to launch aboard the first SLS to go to the moon uh, in the early 2020s called the Lunar Flashlight. And what they're going to do is they're going to kick one of these solar sail powered um, uh, CubeSats out into orbit about the moon, and they're going to use the solar sail to fly it around uh, in orbit about the moon. But when they get to the pole of the moon, where there are some craters that are so deep that sunlight never reaches them, they're going to turn the solar sail around and reflect sunlight uh, from the sun into those craters so they can directly search for water uh, in the permanently shadowed regions uh, on the moon. And that basically uses the solar sail both as propulsion and as the key part of a scientific instrument. Well, that's just genius. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think about about this ha this being privately made? I mean, is it is it weird that NASA? I mean, they've done some experiments, and, and NASA launched a what's it, the Nano Sail? 
So they've done some tests with, with solar sails as well, but it's weird to me that nobody is really doing some serious experiments and really trying to start putting this to use. Why did it, why did it take the Planetary Society to do this? Oh, I think that there's just a lot of technologies that are being developed at once and not very many uh, technology demonstration missions uh, capable of, of testing those technologies. And so uh, NASA has tested a, a solar sail in the last uh, five years, uh, but I think right now that they're more um, interested in the idea of the, uh, the ion propulsion engines. Uh, and I was actually just sitting um, yesterday in a talk by the principal investigator of the Dawn spacecraft. Uh, and he made an offhand comment that they will run out of every possible consumable on their spacecraft before they will run out of fuel uh, for the ion engine. Mm -hmm. And so that in no way sets the lifespan of, um, of the mission. They're thinking that the spacecraft will physically break down uh, before they run out of fuel for that. Uh, and so I think right now NASA might see that as a more proven technology that has some of the same benefits as a solar sail without uh, needing to go through additional uh, technology development. Until um, they get the EM drive working. Yeah, <laughs> but I think what we're seeing here is really the beginning of um, the opportunity for uh, privately funded corporations, privately funded uh, charities like the Planetary Society, etc., to develop new and innovative space technology. Because sure, this one launched on you know a government-funded Atlas V along with you know a top-secret military space plane. But next year, when they launch the actual uh, Light Sail One, it'll be launched on a. a a Falcon Heavy uh, built by SpaceX uh, at a price much lower than what they'd otherwise be able to uh, afford buying from a, a government-backed um, spaceflight company. And this is the this is sort of you know the SpaceX dream: lower the cost of barrier to get into space, and people are going to do all sorts of cool things with it. And I think the fact that the Planetary Society, an advocacy group uh, that's supposed to go to Congress and say, "Hey, fund planetary," is now able to invest in their own planetary uh, research and technology, uh, says a lot about where things are going. I think it's great that we've got to the point where we can do these privately funded missions. I think it really shows that people really want to do exploration. They're not willing to take a back seat and let NASA do it. They want to do it themselves. And I think it's fantastic that this is now actually starting to happen. We've seen a bunch of these. I mean, we've seen what happened with uh, Planetary Resources, with their fundraising campaign. We're seeing this with, with the Planetary Society. I think you're exactly right. Uh, kind of going in concert with what everything that, that SpaceX is doing, I think people are finally feeling like they can have more control and more to contribute to the human and robotic exploration of space. And all of these people, all this pent-up demand is now finding an outlet, and it's it's pretty exciting. This is citizen um, science on the largest scale. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's really a, a harbinger of better things to come. Of course, I need to... Uh, sort of mentioned that I that I work for an offshoot of the X Prize, of course, for HeroX, and this is sort of the kind of stuff that we do, challenges, you know, anyone can build X Prizes. So I'm a little jaded in that I've completely drank all the Kool-Aid. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Um, well, let's move on to another, another story. So let's talk about uh, Chinese plans to land on the far side of the moon and mine it. Yeah, so, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, last year, uh, actually two years ago now, in 2013, uh, China landed uh, their first mission on the near side of the moon, Chang-3, uh, and this was the first successful soft landing uh, on the surface of the moon since the Soviet Union had been there back in 1976. So after the United States and the Soviet Union had kind of gone to the moon, been there, done that, nobody was going back, at least to land. Uh, and two years ago, China landed. They put both a, a lander, an orbiter, and a rover on um, the surface of, of the moon, and they did uh, some science there on the near side. Uh, but, of course, like most uh, space missions, they didn't just build one of all of the pieces for this. They basically built enough to have a backup system. Uh, and now that uh, Chiang-3 basically succeeded, they're looking, well, what can we do with this extra uh, hardware? And, and so they're going to basically go back to the moon with it. Uh, but 
And a lot of people, I think, thought they'd just land somewhere else on the near side of the moon, do some more of the similar science, kind of Apollo style, where you spread out and land a bunch of different places and, and make comparisons. But uh, China really wants to be pushing forward uh, with their space program. And the idea that they have is in 2020 to land not on the near side of the moon, uh, but on the far side of the moon. And this is uh, much more challenging, uh, and in fact has never actually been done by any country um, to land on the far side. Uh, and what makes the far side so much more difficult is exactly that. It's, it's far away. It never faces planet Earth. Uh, the moon is uh, what we call tidally locked with the Earth, which means the same face of the moon always points towards the Earth. It's why no matter what, where you are on Earth, whenever you look up, you see the same basic features uh, on the moon. You only see the one side. Uh, and what that means is you can't just put a lander on the surface of the moon and have it beam commands back uh, to Earth and to communicate with it from Earth. You need to also have a relay satellite in orbit about the um, moon that can then fly to the far side, pick up data from the, the, the rover or the lander, fly back around to the near side, beam it back to Earth, collect the next set of commands, and keep going. This is how we basically communicate with the Mars rovers. Uh, and so it's not a sort of unknown uh, mission design, but it's something that hasn't yet been detected or, or tried here on, on the moon. Uh, but there's a lot of good reasons to go to the far side of the moon. It looks extremely different than the near side. It's much more heavily cratered, uh, and it contains uh, something called the South Pole Aitken Basin, which is possibly the largest impact structure uh, in the entire solar system. This is uh, thousands of kilometers across, um, large enough that it probably penetrated down to this interior of the moon, what we call the mantle of the moon, and kicked out a lot of material from the mantle onto the surface of the moon. And so if you could land by some of this mantle material and rove over to it and examine it, you'd be able to look at the interior of the moon without actually having to drill down, you know, tens or hundreds of kilometers uh, in to see it. And that would answer a lot of really sort of pressing questions about the formation of the moon and the subsequent development of the moon over the last few billion years. But but as sort of where this is leading up to is that the Chinese are are planning to to eventually do a sample return mission from the moon uh, and specifically try to bring back some helium-3, which is a pretty special substance that we don't find on Earth, but we do find in large quantities on the moon. That's Directly. right. Helium-3 is uh, helium that instead of having uh, two neutrons, just has one neutron. So two protons, one neutron makes three. As opposed to normal helium, which we call helium-4, has two protons and uh, two neutrons. Uh, and helium-3 is extremely rare on, on the Earth, but is found in rocks on the Moon. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of uses on Earth right now, but it has one enormous potential use, and that's as part of fusion reactions. Uh, it's actually easier to start fusion and to get it going with helium-3 than it is with normal helium. And so if we could make cold fusion work here on uh, Earth, then helium-3 would be an incredibly valuable um, resource to sustaining uh, global energy production. Uh, until that happens, uh, there's not a lot uh, that you can really do with it here on Earth. Uh, but fortunately, we're probably further away from mining the surface of the moon than we are from getting helium uh, or getting fusion working uh, here on Earth. Uh, so if we develop these simultaneously, then we have the opportunity to make use of this, um, of this rare resource to produce uh, a lot more sustainable energy on Earth. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of imagine, right, the solar wind is constantly blowing from the sun, and it's just spraying the Earth and the moon with, with these particles, the, the helium-3. It doesn't last in the Earth's atmosphere, but and it doesn't collect, but on the moon, it's just getting sprayed down and just layering up inside the highest level of the lunar regolith. And so this is sort of one, this is one of the big justifications that people use on why we should set up a base on the moon, is that this, if we do figure out nuclear fusion, then this is the place to go and, and get it. Yeah, so that's a big if right now, it, though. Big if, yeah, if, yeah, if we can harness nuclear fusion, which is something that's always 40 years out, right? And we can build a radio telescope while we're at it. Well, that's, that is the true purpose of this Chinese mission. So this tiny Ultimately, little rover, that must be cool. yeah, he's gonna, it's just going to go and find some great crater and just 
you know, set up the uh, the structure of a of a big, great big Chinese. So this is telescope. this is an idea that's being worked on actually here where I work uh, at the University of Colorado. Is that you don't need to put a big Arecibo like metal dish uh, on the far side of the moon to uh, have a radio telescope. Instead, you could land some rovers that kind of wind out uh, strips of metal under the surface that then sort of bend into disc like shape uh, that would be able to uh, collect radio signals. And because, like Reese was saying, uh, the advantage of radio is you don't need a very finely shaped surface. You can get away with a lot of uh, inconsistencies in this in order to uh, get the benefits of radio silence. But this is you know, f far, far off uh, in the future as far as, as we can tell. Yeah, first thing, let's try landing something on it. So go China. Uh, let's do one more story here that NASA has certified SpaceX to cover launch probes. That's right. So this has kind of been a weird thing that, um, strange limbo that SpaceX has been in. They've been delivering cargo to the space station now uh, for a number of years, but they haven't been uh, certified to launch, and, and that cargo includes scientific experiments uh, to be operated on the space station amongst other sensitive equipment, uh, but they hadn't been certified to actually launch uh, robotic probes uh, for NASA, probes that would go to... Um, orbit around the Earth, but also that would go out and, and study other things in the solar system. It's strange uh, that they're that they're further along with the human rating than they are with the robotic spacecraft rating, right? Yeah, it speaks to sort of how the different arms of NASA uh, work independently of one another. Uh, and this is maybe typical of a lot of government uh, bureaucracy is one hand doesn't know what the other one is doing and it took a while for the various tests and things that NASA mandates uh, before these can happen to um, to be completed. Uh, but SpaceX, uh, the Falcon 9 in particular, is now certified uh, to launch uh, all but the most important, and by important we mean expensive, uh, of the NASA mission. So you can't launch the next Curiosity uh, or the next Cassini or the next Voyager on a Falcon 9, uh, but you could launch uh, pretty much anything smaller than that. So you can, I mean, obviously NASA would love to be able to stick stuff on the Falcon Heavy. Those big, big spacecraft, you know, that would really help decrease their, their expenses and uh, just, you know, Musk's domination of, of all things space just continues. Yeah, it's a good step for the company. It's going to provide another source of uh, revenue for them, and certainly this is something other countries will see as well and, and be more likely to uh, purchase a SpaceX uh, launch for their uh, telecommunications launch. Or, or well, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you look at the manifest of, of the big launches, and a lot of the times it's these great big you know, one ton plus telecommunication satellites. They're the stuff that go up to geosynchronous orbits and let you watch television. Um, and uh, and that's what a lot of the stuff that are launching all the time are. And for SpaceX to really get NASA's approval will just really help get everyone else's approval. So this, because the, the NASA launches are the most... Uh, you know, when I think about this, they're like they have sort of the most checks and balances, the most quality control. The, you know, these, these missions are billions of dollars, and so they they really are going to have a fairly high level that that SpaceX is going to have to get to. So I think this is this is a way for them to then demonstrate to anyone else who wants to buy a satellite launch. We've been approved. Absolutely, by NASA. Uh, you want to build up as much of that commercial. Uh, presence as possible because commercializing things uh, in general makes them better much faster. And so you were asking Reese earlier, why do radio telescopes have one pixel or seven pixels? And he talked a little bit about uh, the, the wavelength of radio of light and how that poses challenges for designing these detectors. But that's only sort of half the story. The other half of the story is that nobody wants a radio telescope in their smartphone. Uh, optical detectors, CCDs, have gotten exponentially better in the last 15 or 20 years because there's huge commercial incentive to develop pocket digital cameras uh, and webcams and smartphone cameras and all of this stuff. Uh, and so when and, and these were all technologies that were originally developed by NASA and by the military for scientific applications. 
Uh, and because they were able to find a commercial use for them, their costs came down, the quality went substantially up. Uh, and that's what we'd like to see with launches from Orbital and SpaceX uh, and Blue Origin, et cetera, is that when you get people using them to launch their weather satellites and their communication satellites, uh, et cetera, that's going to drive the cost down and give more data for these rocket companies to improve their products. Uh, and, and that ultimately will come back and benefit us as scientists and as space enthusiasts. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got a few more questions that I thought we would get to and then start to wrap this up. So this comes from Cyril Vila. Uh, via? You have to tell me which way that goes. Uh, so if there's any time left. Uh, so, Reese, uh, can you express your opinion on METI or active SETI? Do you think it is wise to attempt to actively send communication messages to potential ETs out there? First, let me give a thanks to Ciro for inviting me to or suggesting me to, to this. Thank you, Ciro, very much. Much appreciated. So, active SETI, is it a good idea? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I'm of the opinion if they really wanted to come and get us, they'd have done it by now, so I don't see any harm in doing this. So, so is it a good idea in that it's a pointless waste of time and there's no chance that it's going to work? Is that sort of the gist? Or Because, you know, I mean, one of the other thoughts out there, right, is that we have been actively broadcasting our existence since the rise of oxygen on the planet Earth. So what's that? About a billion years or so, we've been uh, broadcasting the, the fact that, that there's life here on Earth, and they could have scooped us up at any point. The, the berserkers should have arrived a few hundred million years ago to scour the planet free of life and leave a bunch of monoliths. So, so why hasn't that happened? Well, yeah, of course, that is the Fermi paradox. If they existed, they would be here. There is uh, the, the notion that colonizing the galaxy is, is not actually that difficult. We already have technologies on the drawing board, at least, that could get us to the nearest star in many centuries or tens of thousands of years, but that's still more than enough time to have colonized the galaxy dozens of times over if any aliens had evolved that could and would do that. Uh, and so I think, uh, to me, nobody has a satisfactory answer to that yet. I mean, the, the, the frightening prospect is that maybe we are alone. Uh, however arrogant you might think it is to, to say that, because we, we, you look at all these millions or hundreds of billions of stars and think, how can it just be us? But the, the frightening answer is that we just don't see any evidence of anyone else, and no one has come to colonize our planet so far as we know. No one appears to be interested in coming to abduct us particularly, so maybe we are alone. It's a a perfectly valid answer to the question at this point, I think. So you think that at this point uh, there's no real additional risk to to send a message out there? I, I see n no risk whatsoever. I think if they, if they really did want to come and get us, they already know that we're here and they would have done it by now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, think about our extrasolar planet program. We're we are now starting to detect the atmospheres of other planets going around other worlds. Yeah. And how, how long has it taken us from when we detected our first planet, 1995, what, Pegasus... Uh, um, 51, Pegasus. Peg, Peg 51, you know, and it was like 95, and now here we are 20 years later and detecting, using Spitzer and stuff, the atmospheres, and now whole new programs are coming out that will detect in bulk the atmospheres of other worlds, and we're just looking for the one that's got too much pollution in the atmosphere, and then we're like, there's life there, then we send the berserkers, and we wipe them off that world. So it's just a matter of time. Um, so they, do. they should be afraid of us. They should have turned off their oxygen and just held their <laughs> breath for a few hundred <laughs> million years if they were really smart, but it's too late now. Um, so Michael Meyer says, uh, Fraser, does the Kerbal Space Program have solar sails? Uh, it does not, but there is a mod kit you can use. I think it's called the Interplanetary Interstellar Kit, and you can modify the Kerbal Space Program to have solar sails. So, uh, and I've never done it, but that just sounds awesome. Uh, and if you haven't played the Kerbal Space Program, shame on you. Uh, go buy it right now. Uh, it's often on sale for like 40% off. I love it so much. Um, okay, so Maria APG asks, uh, Falcon 9, SpaceX, what will they be transporting now if not experiments and supplies? So they're still going to be transporting experiments and supplies, but now we're just talking about people and really expensive spacecraft, right? 
Right, this is an additional capability, uh, not replacing or changing uh, an existing capability. I think probably we're not going to see a lot of scientific launches on, on Falcon 9s uh, solely because they can't crank them out of the factory fast enough. Uh, they had 13 launches on the docket for uh, 2015, and that's a you know a remarkable number of launches for any uh, space company. And I think they're building them as as rapidly as they can. Uh, and so NASA is going to have to be com a, a competitor along with all of these other commercial interests and their own uh, human spaceflight program uh, in delivering cargo to the space station. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, why don't we wrap things up? So, uh, Morgan. Where do people find out more? Yeah, well, right after here, you can uh, head over to the Google Plus space community, uh, space uh, community under uh, Google Plus. Just go to plus.google.com, click on communities, and find space. I'll take any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Uh, otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, uh, at Morgan Renberg. Uh, check out my website, morganrenberg.com, uh, and read my uh, latest uh, Cassini mission update uh, over at send.com, so talking about uh, how Cassini uh, can see magnetic fields without actually seeing them this week. So pretty cool stuff. That's fantastic. All right, and and Reese, so where can people, if they want to follow your journey from from space, sorry, from Arecibo to Prague, how where can they find out more? Uh, well, you can always follow me on Google Plus for the latest exciting updates. You can visit my website www.reese.net, or you can read my blog, Physicists Formerly of the Caribbean. Right. Uh, but you're not on Twitter. I am not on Twitter, and I never will be. You must be the only I, person on Earth I, who's on I Google Plus and not on Twitter. As well. I'm not on Facebook either. Well, that's just smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I swore that I was just like, I was, I'm not going to use Twitter. I'm sick of it. It's stupid, and, and here I am. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, so I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. You can uh, subscribe to this channel, which is if you're watching this anywhere on YouTube, like take a second, go to the YouTube page, click subscribe. Not only do you get the show every Friday, you also get two of our Guide to Space videos every week where we cover all kinds of sort of insane rambling topics. Uh, what did we just launch? How bad will solar storms get? And, uh, and we definitely do a lot of scaremongering in that video, which is really fun. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of batch. We've actually got one about the, would we see the aliens coming? So would we be able to detect their arrival? That's coming out in the next couple of uh, weeks. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and watch some of our silly videos. Um, I mean, our educational videos. They're very <laughs> educational. Um, but yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. And, uh, and once again, I want to remind people there are these two communities that are associated with this, right? There's what, uh, what Morgan mentioned, which is to go to the space community on Google+. And Cyril Vila, who recommended Reese this week, is one of the moderators of the space community and a really dedicated person. And Cyril, if you're watching this, thank you so much for all of your help for the years, literally, that you've been helping with all of the space and astronomy on on Google Plus, and thanks for setting this 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 guest up. We really appreciate it. So, check out the community, the Google Plus Space Community, one of the largest on Google Plus, um, and and talk to Morgan and ask him any questions you might have. And then the other one, of course, is the Weekly Space Hangout Crew, WSH Crew on uh, Google Plus, and that's where you can really kind of really talk to the fans of of this show. Who, but the fans of the show make the show, so you're really talking to yourself. Anyway, I, I can't really think this out too much. So, uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you all next week.